Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this little video I have for you yet even more strange and dark disappearances that are still a mystery to this day. Here for you folks, I got six cases for you where in some of these stories it's like people just wandered off and were never found. Others are just inexplicable, happening under circumstances that are baffling. Prepare to scratch your L noodle as we go from a disturbing discovery in a fridge to a story some believe involves feral people. That's wild. Before we get into it, please subscribe to see new videos every single week. Now, let's give it a go. Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez. Let's begin with what happened near Madrid, Spain in the mid-1980s. The date was June 25th, 1986, and just north of the capital lies the Somo Sierra Mountain Pass, a beautiful little area about an hour's drive north. Pretty sparsely populated, but historically an important route between the mountains of Spain. The day in question, a truck was driving that beep beep route, and inside the truck was Andres Martinez, his wife Carmen, and their 10-year-old son, Juan Pedro. The family were all originally from Murcia in the southeast of the country, and by all accounts a happy family, decent folk, and Juan a good student and a quick learner. Now Andres worked as a truck driver making deliveries all around the country, and his young son Juan Pedro loved, absolutely mad, to get to hang out with his dad going around trucks. Juan Pedro loved trucks, as all young boys do, because you know what, they're pretty cool. So his dad would make these deliveries of industrial goods all around the country, and Juan would sometimes go with him, but not never too far because, you know, school and stuff. This particular trip, though, was quite a ways away from home. The reason for this extended trip is that it was during the summer break, and Juan, he'd gotten really good grades, so it was kind of like a little treat for, for him. And so, Andres, Carmen, and young Juan were traveling from Cartagena in the south all the way north to Bilbao. And what they were transporting, this sounds like the beginning of a Looney Tunes cartoon, was a big vat of sulfuric acid. They picked up the truck on the 24th, and by the 25th, when they were north of Madrid, by all accounts it was going well. They stopped off frequently, were making it a bit of an adventure, but it was all good, till it wasn't. The last person to speak with them was a waiter. Uh, they'd stopped off at this like roadside restaurant, and he said they were grand. They were in great form, you know, they, they seemed fine. They were happy out, not abnormal. They, he remembered, he remembered Juan Pedro because Juan was wearing, little boy was wearing a red shirt like the waiter was. And then they got off. However, not long after that, things did get weird. Witnesses would say they saw this truck driving extremely erratically on this narrow mountain pass, like swerving all over the road, clipping other cars, running other cars off the road, when just moments before the waiter said they were fine. It was strange as well because Andres, he was very experienced truck driver, he'd been doing this for a long time. Now the roads are very steep, so what some were thinking is the brakes were cut in the truck and he just had absolutely no way of stopping how heavy this was. Once they hit the downhill sections, they would just speed up and speed up and there was nothing he could do to stop the truck. Either way, it kept going down the pass until it eventually smashed into another truck, went off the side of the road. Acid? It seemed to be an extremely tragic crash. And once first responders arrived, they found Andres, 36, and his wife Carmen, 34, dead at the scene, killed upon impact. Andres, it appeared, had been thrown from the cab, and he was found half buried and what's been described as affected by the acid that had just exploded out everywhere. Carmen was found still inside the cab of the truck and she had been crushed. Now, responders couldn't examine the scene properly because so much highly dangerous acid had leaked a toxic cloud even formed over the site. This actually affected the entire area, like a little ecological disaster. It was hours before they could be identified. And then, you know, later on when Carmen's mother was called with the tragic news, all she had to say was, what about the boy? The first responders had no idea there was supposed to be a child here too. This was a shock to first responders. There was no, you know, child at the scene. So where was one? That's the mystery. A search began spiraling out from the crash site. Maybe he had been thrown from the truck. Maybe he'd gotten out and something. Dogs, helicopters, all that was brought in. There was a river nearby that was searched. They even lifted the truck to see if he had been underneath, but no. 
One theory was that his body had been dissolved in the acid, but there for sure would have been something left of him. For acid to just dissolve even your bones, you'd have to be submerged for days and days and days, so he wasn't like melted. He was in the truck for sure, the waiter had seen him just earlier on that day, a rubber sole of one of his shoes was found inside the truck, so he was definitely there. But what happened? And the brake lines to the truck were checked, and guess what? They were actually working. So why they were driving that way is a mystery too. Tres personas han muerto esta mañana en un espectacular accidente de tráfico. So then, the theories began. Right, one witness would say they saw a white van pull up next to the truck, the accident. This is before the first responders arrived. And a man and a woman got out and they, the witnesses said they saw a young boy get into this white van. They, they said that the man and a woman spoke German. White van drove off. Who the heck were they, if that even happened? But multiple witnesses reported seeing that. Very opportunistic kidnappers. It appears. But it's weird that both his parents would have been killed in this like terrible accident and he was fine. Just jogged on. Others say Juan was taken as part of a drugs debt. That Andres, alongside delivering materials, also delivered some of the devil's dandruff. By force, maybe even. And that Juan was taken when Andres failed to pay a debt. That that's why Andres was driving so radically that day. He was either chasing Juan, who had been taken by kidnappers, or he just was extremely upset and um... Now, a secret compartment was found inside his truck containing drugs, so there's some truth to him being a drug runner, I guess. I mean, others say maybe Andres, he'd only bought the truck a year before, so maybe he didn't know about it, but that sounds kind of eh, unbelievable. Juan's family believed the kidnapping aspect. That's what they came out with publicly, which they say led to them receiving threatening phone calls. Some think he was dissolved in acid. Others, that his body was thrown from the truck and simply never found. Others, that he was kidnapped or was rescued and ran away. But no one knows for sure. Russell Bowling. In 2010, Yorkshire, a young man named Russell Bowling mysteriously vanished under very creepy circumstances. Now, no, to the police, right? They say this is open and shut. To the family, they say no, and there is ample evidence to show this is a lot more bizarre than what the police are saying. Russell Bowling was 18 years of age in 2010, born in Hull, England, and he still lived in the area, in the family home in West Ella, a suburb of the city. After school, he wanted to go on and be a builder, and so he was studying bricklaying at the time of his disappearance. By all accounts, he was a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, excited for the future. Very excited, in fact as he was due to receive £300,000 from his father, he was due to receive that very soon to help Russell set up his own business. That's a lot of money, a nice chunk of ching, especially as Russell was only 18 years of age. That's a lot of money for a young man to be getting. But I guess his parents thought he had a really good head on his shoulders. Let's get to the day of his disappearance, which was March 2nd, 2010. That morning, by all accounts, he left the house early to go, um, you know, study bricklaying at college. Normal ass day. However, whether he actually made it into college that day um, kind of remains a mystery. Nobody really knows for sure. He was driving his car. He left the house in his car. His car was seen pulling into the parking lot of the college, but whether it was actually his car or just a car that looked like his, we don't know. And if it pulled in, nobody knows if it actually parked there. There's a lot of unsures as to what he was doing that morning. But what is sure though, is that that day, his car was found 45 miles away at this place called Bempton Cliff, a nature reserve, very pretty area. In fact, there lies a former RAF Royal Air Force bunker, but it's been disused since the early 70s. His car was spotted by a worker there and was still there the following morning. But later, witnesses would not be able to say they caught a glimpse of anybody resembling Russell that day. A parking ticket for a full day's parking was found inside his car, with his fingerprints on it so we can be sure he drove in. And it's believed he had been googling the RAF base there and the area the morning of. Then he disappeared. This story then gets very strange. So the morning of, before he went to college, if he did go to college, it's known he had been on his computer googling the area, and in fact, he had, this is weird, a memory stick. Nobody knows who gave him this memory stick, where it is now, what was on it, but there was information on that memory stick related 
to this RAF base. This is a comment on an article reportedly written by his mother. It seems he was very interested in that bunker, the abandoned RAF bunker. She even writes that the info he was searching about, he didn't find it online. It was given to him via a USB stick by someone. Plans of the bunker, maybe more information that remains unknown. But that is just a gateway to an underground layer. Bars on windows. Look at this. Secret bunker info. It appears that the morning of he'd been researching this bunker and then went there. And then what? Now the bunker has links to the occult. It looks small on top, but it's apparently quite large. It was an old radar base. And there are rumors of some satanic cults being attached to it. Like there is in all good stories. Devil worshippers allegedly used this bunker. One thing is for sure though, there's a lot of sexy drawings on the wall. But the place sure does seem creepy. Good old satanic graffiti. Anything could have happened down here and just no one would know. So when Russell never came home, um, you know, the police were called, they began a missing persons investigation, they retraced his movements. The day he left home, didn't tell his family where he was going, he visited a few other cities on the way to Bempton Cliff, like way out of the way. Why, no one knows, but it was very unusual. A later full search of the bunker revealed nothing, no trace of him. And then he just simply disappeared. The police believe what they think has happened is he drove there and he just jumped off the cliff and he was never found. That does seem, you know, most likely. In fact, the police found a tape in the house of him imitating hurting himself. So they believed, you know, this kind of ideation led to this. But the, the family have disputed that, saying the tape of him hurting himself. That's from years and years ago and was related to a very particular set of circumstances when he was extremely stressed due to school exams. His family hard disagree that he did this to himself. First of all, he was in a great place. He was about to receive 300 grand to start his own business. There's also plenty of evidence. They think someone was with him that day and that maybe he was lured to the bunker. Maybe by someone with links to the graffiti or the occult and something happened. The reasons are thus. He drove way out of his way that day for seemingly no reason unless he was going to get a secret friend or secret friends. He didn't have enough gas or petrol in his car to make the trip that he did. He rarely carried cash on him and his bank cards were not used that day. So someone else must have paid at the stations. Who gave him this mysterious USB which has never been found. So like maybe somebody knew about the money he was going to receive and wanted to get it off him, but he hadn't received the money yet and they never would get it off him anyway. And later, uh, CP was found on his dad's computer, which is weird and gross, but uh, apparently that's just unrelated, that his dad was like a pervert. Some people think it's maybe it was related, that maybe something dad, him, I don't know, there's a lot of wacky theories out there. A lot of strangeness in this case, but interesting, is that his family owned a holiday home in Ravenscar, north of the bunker. His family say that two years after he vanished, one day they were at this house in Ravenscar and they found his shoes there. The shoes he'd been wearing the day he disappeared. Caitlin Aikens. This next one takes us to Virginia. When 19 year old Caitlin Aikens disappeared under quite frankly, creepy ass circumstances. Caitlin was born September 2nd, 1996 to parents Lisa and Jason, growing up in Spotsylvania, Virginia. Now Lisa and Jason, unfortunately, the marriage didn't last too long. They split and Lisa met a new man, James Branton, an insurance salesman. He became stepfather to Caitlin and her younger sister Gabby. And as Jason kind of exited early, James really raised the two girls. James, uh, he was like, all right, him and Caitlin didn't get on too well. She didn't get on too well with her stepdad. Apparently they would just butt heads a lot and just wanted to be verbally abusive, but I don't believe there's any reports of him like laying hands on the two girls at all. Now, Caitlin, very intelligent. She graduated school early and in fact moved to Arizona when she was 18 years old with her fiance, a woman named Amber. Things were good. In December, 2015, Caitlin flew back to Virginia from where she was living 
in Arizona. Her younger sister, Gabby, had just given birth. And so Caitlin wanted to meet her new nephew. She was only staying for, you know, a couple of days. She was due to fly back to Arizona on December 5th as she had to get back to school. And that is when the story begins. Because she never made it to Regan National Airport where she was supposed to fly from. Why didn't she? That's the mystery. What we do know is this. Caitlin was getting a ride to the airport with her now former stepfather, James Branton. James and Lisa had divorced. Now James was like their last choice, as you can imagine. Caitlin and James didn't get on A, that well, all already. And B, if your mother and this guy kind of, your stepfather divorced, it's kind of like, ooh, awkward. <laughs> but in this area, there's like zero public transport, so she had to get a lift. Her flight was at five, right? And so James, he was in work at Tree, so he said, I'll drop her off to the airport early. A little bit early. When I'm heading to work, I'll drop her off then, and that was it. So Caitlin's mother, Lisa, dropped her to James Branton's house at 8 a.m., probably when she was herself going into work. Caitlin was just gonna hang out in his house, head to the airport, and then he'd head to work. That was the plan. Now, oddly, at 1.52 p.m., James texted Lisa, saying he dropped her off at Springfield Metro Station, where she could get the metro to the airport. James was supposed to drop Caitlin off at the airport, not like on the way, but whatever. Then at exactly 2 p.m., Caitlin's mother, Lisa, got a text from Caitlin's phone saying, I'm at the airport, battery dying, won't be able to text for a bit. Caitlin wouldn't have been able to make the trip from the Springfield Metro Station to the airport in eight minutes. So that's weird already as well. And Caitlin never boarded the plane. Her mother, Lisa, didn't think anything weird for hours, five hours, almost exactly, when Lisa received more texts from Caitlin's phone, which I thought Caitlin's phone was dying. The texts Lisa received are one saying, staying with a friend, and another saying, I need some time alone. Lisa tried calling, but it always went to voicemail, and Caitlin was never heard from again. Weirder, earlier that same day at around 12 p.m., Amber, uh, Caitlin's fiance back in Arizona, also received texts from Caitlin saying, I'm not coming back today, I'll let you know. Those texts would have been sent while Caitlin was in James Branton's house. Caitlin was reported a missing, weird text. She hadn't gotten on the plane, no one knows where she was. And two days later, her suitcase was found on the side of the road, over 40 miles from the airport. It appeared like it had been thrown out the window, it was damaged. Now the suitcase was empty, apart from glasses, ID, wallet, there was no clothes or anything like that. And guess what, it was only a few miles from James's home. Now James has always stuck to his story, saying that he dropped her off on the way to work, he dropped her off at the metro station at 1.52pm like he said, and that was it. What happened after that? Who knows? But two things. The police investigation determined that when James texted Lisa saying he had dropped Caitlin off at 1.52pm, his phone in fact was pinging from his home. Same with Caitlin. When she texted saying she was at the airport, battery dying, she was miles and miles away. Same with the later texts. It's also been learned that James never went into work that day, and that was the entire reason for him dropping Caitlin off early, was that he had to go into work. So what did he do instead? CCTV also didn't show James nor Caitlin at the metro station or the airport. Now James initially agreed to take a polygraph, but he, he backed out. The police did get a warrant to search his home, and they found absolutely nothing. No DNA, no evidence. Almost as if Caitlin had never set foot in his house at all. He encrypted his phone so police can't access it as he refused to give them the password. And where Caitlin is today, no one knows. But James Branton has never been charged in relation to her disappearance. Charles Rogers. The next mysterious disappearance takes us all the way back to the year 1965, if you can believe that. And it begins like all good stories do, with a horrifying discovery. Near central Houston lies Hyde Park, a residential area fairly dense, you know the drill. Much the same today as it would have been 60 years ago when Adam was uh, a grasshopper's knee height or whoever that saying goes. Let's begin on the evening of June 23rd, 1965. Police were attempting to enter 1815 Driscoll Street in Hyde Park. They were there to do a welfare check on the home's elderly occupants, Fred and Edwina Rogers. Their nephew hadn't heard from them and had become uh, concerned. In the house lived Fred, 81 years old, his wife Edwina, 73, and their son, 
43-year-old Charles Rogers. The police managed to gain entry to the home via the, via the back door, and upon entering, they were getting like a weird vibe from the place. It was empty, oddly empty, but something about it just felt kind of a little bit, you know, off. The kitchen, odd. See, food was all over the tables. Food was everywhere. Food that you would, you know, usually refrigerate, but it wasn't in the fridge. So, opening the fridge, maybe it was full. And it was full. It was full of meat. Just like meat on neatly stacked on all the shelves of the fridge. And the, the cop hog meat, right? Alright, it's about to close the door. Almost about to close the door when he looked down to the vegetable tray and he saw a human head staring back at him. The meat in the fridge was Fred and Edwina, and Fred's head was also found in the crisper. His eyes gouged out, and Charles was nowhere to be found. Mark, was there anything new in the murders from last night? Nothing basically new, Bob, that uh, we didn't have last night. Uh, out at the scene, the men are continuing to work on this case uh, at the scene, and we are beginning to get a little background information uh, concerning the family. Do you, you do want to talk to the son? That is correct, Bob. We do know that the boy lived with his parents, uh, and as of this minute, we have not been able to locate him, or neither do we know too much about him. Police later found the couple's entrails in the sewer. They had been flushed down the toilet. They would determine that five days before they were found, on Father's Day, June 20th, they both had been brutally murdered. Fred beaten to death with a hammer, his eyes ripped out of his head, his genitals removed, and then cut up. Edwina beaten and then shot in the head. Both had been dismembered in the upstairs bathroom. The house had then been thoroughly cleaned. And Charles was absolutely nowhere to be found. Now, I hear you barking, I hear, I hear you barking, big dog. Son goes crazy, brutally murders his parents, and then flees. Nope, because we gotta get into conspiracy territory first. See, Charles was a weird ass guy. 43, still lived with his parents, but in fact he owned the house. He was a World War II vet, he had a degree in nuclear physics, was a trained Navy pilot, and was a seismologist, and had also worked for Shell Oil. Or that's what they want you to think, because really nobody knows much about this mysterious Charles Rogers guy. He'd get up at the crack of dawn and go off somewhere. CIA shit, probably. Then returning at nightfall to do more conspiracy shit. He would barely speak to people, even to his parents. He would slip notes under the door, asking them questions. It would say that he hadn't seen his mother in five whole years. That's what family maid would say. His mother, uh, no face to face. -y. His own neighbors didn't even know he lived there, which sounds like, say it with me now, a spy. And here's more. Charles frickin' Rogers killed John frickin' Kennedy. See, in a book, The Man on the Grassy Knoll, the author asserts, or proves, that Lee Harvey Oswald was framed, because obviously, and that in fact Charles Harrelson, a contract killer and Woody Harrelson's dad, along with Chauncey Holt and Charles Rogers, the three of them killed JFK. Can you believe it? You can't? Oh shit. See, Charles Rogers, he traveled a lot for work, and on one of these trips, he became CIA. He then began impersonating Oswald because, of course, and that those three men, Charles Rogers, Charles Harrelson, and Chauncey Holt, the three C's, they were the tramps arrested the day JFA was killed. JFK. For those dummies out there who don't know, the day JFK was killed, three tramps were arrested. A photo was taken of three tramps being arrested by the police. This is like shortly after the assassination. So obviously they were involved. Boo. Conspiracy theorists have long claimed that they were somehow linked to the murder, the assassination. And although the police released their names, who they really are has always been disputed. But we do know this guy walks cool. And I guess they kind of sort of look like Charles Rogers, Charles Harrelson, and Chauncey Holt. Kind of, sort of, I mean, you know, if you squint. So years later, over a decade after JFK was killed, Charles Harrelson was arrested by the police after murdering a judge. He was a hitman. And guess what? During an interrogation after he was arrested, he claimed to have killed Kennedy. He was also high on cocaine the entire time, but let's not mention that. A relative of Charles said he was in the picture, and Chauncey Holt, who claimed he was one of the tramps but never proved it, said he himself was a CIA agent. And the reason Charles killed his parents? They found his diary, where he wrote about his business. And so, sorry pal, you're 85,000 of life. His CIA training is what let him escape and vanish like a ghost. I don't have a problem with that theory at all. 
Of course, another theory says, um, no, uh, that none of that is true. Sorry. His parents were manipulative people who took advantage of him. That's why the house was in his name. They robbed him. They had turned his life shite. And so, one day, he had enough. He clearly hated them with what he did. And then he had fled America. And using his contacts, you know, in the oil industry, because he used to work for Shell, he moved down all South America way and disappeared. Relisha Rudd. This next story takes us to Washington, D.C., to the year 2014, at a D.C. homeless shelter. D.C. General Shelter, it was once a hospital, but then it was a homeless shelter. Their staying was Shimiki Young and her eight-year-old daughter, Relisha Rudd. This story gets dark, convoluted, and let's just say there's a lot of negligence involving poor Relisha Rudd. Relisha was born in October 2005 to Shimika and Irving in the country's capital. And by all accounts, Relisha a pleasant, gregarious young girl. She loved dancing, school, and having fun with her younger brothers. Now her mother, Shimika, didn't have it easy to say the least. Her mother had been an addict, and Shimika had been in and out of foster homes her whole life, leading to a multitude of mental health issues. She eventually had Relisha, her oldest child, when she was 19 years old with a guy named Irving, Rudd. Uh, Irving now, he was like 15 years older than Shimika, and he was a bit of a character as well, because it turns out that in like the early 90s, he had murdered a previous kid of his, a young baby, by throwing it uh, across the room. Now, uh, he did get charged with it, and there was a trial, but I've really been able to, unable to find out how long he actually spent in jail or in prison for that. But regardless, Shimika and Irving didn't stay together. Now, Shamika, Relisha, and her three younger brothers were staying at this homeless shelter in D.C. So not off to the best start for kind of anybody in this story. And then, you know, you have this young family ending up, and young Relisha ending up in this shelter where you got, you know, it's unkempt conditions, not much food, a lot of neglect going on. Shamika was seeing a new guy at this point, Antonio. He was Relisha's stepfather, and it seems he was a pretty good guy. He cared more about the kids, it seems, than anyone else in the story but work often meant he was away for extended periods of time. Now, at the shelter worked a man named Khalil Tatum. He'd been in and out of prison for most of his life. Burglary, larceny, b &Es, and himself and his wife, Andrea, they too had addiction issues. He was now working at the shelter as a janitor, and was, a, by all accounts, a well-liked, charming guy. But he was also known to get, you know, a little bit too close to the people staying at the shelter where he worked. And also he was accused of spending a, paying like a little bit too much attention to the young girls who stayed there too. You know where this is going. It appears that Shamika and Khalil became close friends at the shelter. She started calling him Relisha's godfather even. And it would give Shamika and the kids gifts, money, almost like he was grooming them. Now Antonio didn't like him and told Khalil Tatum to stay away. But as I said, Antonio himself was away for a lot of the time and couldn't really do a whole lot. Shamika began letting Khalil take Relisha out of the shelter. He adored the little one, it's claimed. To the movies, to the park, shopping, restaurants, all. Sometimes even to his home, so she could sleep over. It was in February 2014 that Relisha stopped attending school. And she loved school. When Shamika was contacted by the school asking where she was by social workers and the school, she gave them a note saying Relisha was ill, health problems, and the note was signed, Dr. Tatum. The school tried contacting, you know, this Dr. Tatum, and they couldn't. So a social worker eventually went to the, the DC General Shelter to ask and see kind of what was going on here. And this social worker asked staff there, do you guys know a, a Dr. Tatum? And the staff said no. But we do know a Khalil Tatum, who's the janitor here. D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier just held a news conference about missing eight-year-old Relisha Rudd. An Amber Alert was issued for Rudd last week. She's believed to be with Khalil Tatum. Relisha was reported missing then, and the police began to search for Khalil. What happened next is kind of a mystery, but Relisha was missing for all, like over a month before she was actually reported missing. Why did you trust him? He didn't look like that type of person. He looked like a good person. The way he played with everybody, kids, the way he did his job, when he needed to do his job, buffing them floors. He didn't look like an intimidated person. He really didn't. The last known footage of Relisha was taken on March 1st, 2015. She was seen walking down a hall with Khalil into a room in a day's inn. This is in DC. After this, she was never seen again. 
She wasn't reported missing till a couple of weeks after this on March 20th, 2015. The same day as she was reported missing, Andrea, Khalil's wife of almost 20 years, was found shot dead in a motel room outside the city. And nearly two weeks later, Khalil himself was found dead in a nearby park. He'd shot himself. It seems Khalil had been on the run for a while before ending it. And Relisha Rudd is still missing. What actually happened during those weeks and like months? Nobody knows. Relisha missed weeks and weeks of school in January and February, but wasn't reported missing until March 20th, when she hadn't been seen for almost a month and not seen on camera for almost three weeks. What were you at? The day after the last sighting of Relisha, which is this footage, Khalil was seen buying a shovel, trash bags, and lime. A lot of theories, but it's believed she is not alive. It's thought maybe Khalil was trafficking her or something. Maybe his wife Andrea found out, so he killed her. He was avoiding the police until he finally killed himself. Shamika was never charged with anything. Relisha fell through the cracks again and again, and so a predator like Khalil Tatum was able to take advantage of that and leave everybody else with a big mystery, big question mark as to what actually happened. Dennis Martin. The final dark disappearance I have for you in this whole one is what happened when a almost seven-year-old boy disappeared in the woods, and it is uh, spooky, real spooky. On June 14th, 1969, William Martin, along with his two sons, Douglas and Dennis, and his father, Clyde, they were all going on a camping trip together. Three generations of the Martins boys. A nice trip for the lads. This was on Father's Day weekend, and they aimed to hike through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. They were originally from Knoxville and had made the trek. This was a Martin family tradition. Dennis, the youngest at only six, almost seven, was doing great keeping up with the others, and the first day went very well, making it to Spence Field not far from the famous Appalachian Trail. They were going to spend the night there along with another family. They had met up, met up with along the way. And Dennis and Douglas, grand little kids, they were kind of playing with the other kids, the kids from the other family. At one point, they decided to have some fun. They were going to go into the woods and sneak up on their parents and spook them, you know, a real gotcha moment. The adults knew, of course, they could see the kids going into the woods. They were like, you know, it was very, very obvious what the kids were doing, but hey, it's all in good fun. And they could see Dennis. Dennis was wearing a bright red shirt. It was like standing out clear as day in like the, the brush around them. And so the parents were like, all right, all right. They're sitting there talking. And then at one point the kids jump out. Ah, you got me, you know, good one. Great, great stuff. But not all the boys jumped out. Dennis hadn't. He'd been there a second ago, though. No one knew where he was. He was literally right there. The kids jump out. He was gone. The adults started calling for him, then looking for him, looking to see that red shirt in the foliage. But he wasn't there. They went up and down the trail for miles, all around the area, and nothing. After a few hours and having no way to call for help, Grandad Clyde went to the nearest ranger station, which was nine miles away. That night, a massive rainstorm just so happened to hit also. And over the following hours, about two and a half inches of rain fell quite a lot. Also washing away any trails, footprints, evidence left behind. And the fact that a six-year-old boy was out there alone was terrifying. Over the following days, a massive search began. Hundreds poured into the area, and eventually over a thousand would be involved. Even the Green Berets were there, and if they can't find you, you probably can't be found. Everything was there. Helicopters, you name it. In fact, so many were there, some think they may have inadvertently destroyed clues due to the sheer number of people walking through the area. $5,000 was offered for information, and nothing. He simply vanished. One searcher did claim to find footprints in the mud, child size. Now, others, uh, other people said, oh, it was just another kid, you know, helping to search like a Boy Scout who's helping searchers. But this guy said the footprints was like child size, quite small. And one of the prints was a shoe print. The other was a bare footprint. And none, why would one of the searchers be only wearing one shoe? That it could have been Dennis. But these, these prints went to the river and then they disappeared. Other theories have come forward. Like one was a tourist in the area hiking also named Harold Key. He claimed that on the day Dennis Martin vanished, he'd been walking along and he had heard this horrific screaming coming from the woods. Then he saw some dirty looking guy running around. 
He ran off and into a car which must have been nearby in the woods. On the ground he then found a hand-drawn map. Now searchers say this may have happened, but it was too far from where Dennis would have been to, you know, have been related. Some claim there are feral people in those mountains. Half man, half beast. Also known as hillbillies. Half man, half beast, yet he knows how to drive. Fair play to you. Or maybe you know it was Bigfoot, never discount Bigfoot. Though also what are theories about what happened to Dennis is like, maybe it was just not half beast, full beast. Like a bear or a cougar. His young six-year-old boy. Years later, a hunter uh, in the woods claimed he found child bones uh, in the forest floor. Um, now, he didn't report this at the time because he was hunting illegally. Years later, he had a switcher of their mind. But by that stage, the, the bones were gone. They never found them. Five years later, 16-year-old Trenny Gibson vanished in those same mountains. She was on a school field trip there with 38 other students, and her disappearance is very weird too, in that it was a blink and she was gone, just like Dennis. So, they, students and a teacher, they got out of the bus and were to hike to Andrews Bald, this one mountain and back as part of this school trip. They were just there to observe, do not go off the trail, whatever you do, don't do that. The teacher even made sure, he's like, do not go off the trail, raise your hand if you understand that, all the kids raised their hand. So Trenny, she hiked up the trail and they were on their way back and she was walking with some friends as they were walking back to the bus. And at one point, about a half mile from the bus, uh, her friends sat down, they needed to rest. But Trenny was like, you know, I just, I'm good to go, I'm gonna keep going. Her friends watched Trenny as she kept walking. And at one point they saw her look down and bend over and pick something up off the ground. Then she immediately just hard rights off the trail. Her friends, they looked away for another classmate who was coming. They looked back and Trenny was gone. And she remains gone. She never made it to the bus and a search turned up nothing at all. Now, one theory the students had was that she had run off with someone, but the problem with that is the students were only informed of where they were going while on the bus. It was a surprise. Maybe she was lured off the trail or something. Cigarette butts, alcohol can, like beer cans were found near where she walked off. That led to almost to the Roehook Trail and cigarettes, but nothing was ever found. These areas are so dense with vegetation, like with Dennis, you can easily go missing, fall down a crevasse or a mine shaft or something. A lot can go wrong, no matter who you are. Which makes it all the more frightening when people simply vanish in the woods. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it means a lot, as always, that you are here with Misha. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, listen, next video will be up in a couple of days, so please give it a go. Uh, and also, I'm on Twitter, that underscore chapter. Instagram is the same, and all that stuff, so. Uh, check it out, Patreon for early access to videos, and that chapter podcast. God, I've got so much going on. Um, but most importantly is the next video we up in a couple of days. I already said that. You know, please take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out.